and um, during the second week they decided they wanted to video the series. So they didn't catch the first week and that's why they're here tonight or today. Uh, they won't be here the next six weeks just for today to catch this series. But uh, let me begin by introducing myself and let you all know who I am. I was born and raised right here in River City and grew up in Asbury for the most part. We moved over to Asbury when I was in seventh or eighth grade and started attending church over at Wasbury. Remember that one over there? <laughs> and uh, met my wife over there and we got married while we were going to school at Oklahoma State University and graduated from there, came back. When we came back, I, you know, just like everybody else, I was going to go into business and make a whole lot of money. And so I went into the mortgage business, and the mortgage business back in the early 80s was pretty good. And I was making some pretty good money. I was doing a lot of mortgages. I worked very closely with realtors and go sit and open houses with them to qualify people. And things were going great until about 1987 <laughs> or 86, actually. Uh, it was. Something happened here called, well, there's two things, a federal savings and loan bust, followed shortly thereafter by the oil bust. And 40,000 people in the city of Tulsa lost their jobs. I happened to be one of them. And then my wife was another one of them. And we had a six-month-old baby in a brand new house. So um, fortunately, we knew a guy that went to church here named Sue Schwer. He hired me to go over to Drysdale's and sell shirts. And I was not real good at selling shirts. It kind of bored me. But I was really good at catching shoplifters. <laughs> so I started catching shoplifters there, and then I went over to Renberg, started catching shoplifters there. And then there were two job openings in the city of Tulsa at the time. One was with the fire department, the other was with the police department. And I knew that I did not want to carry a hose for a living. <laughs> so I became a, a police officer. Which, by the way, do you want to know why we actually have police officers? It's because, no, no, no. pardon me. No, no. no, no. Even firemen need heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Let that one sink in. <laughs> any, any firemen in the room? Good. Um, you know, the, the police and the fire, we, uh, we have this running joke going back and forth, but let me tell you, when we need the firemen and they show up, we love to see them, and when they need us and we show up, they love to see us. I've been on several situations where firemen were out fighting a fire and they started getting shot at. And it, it's hard to return fire with a hose, um, that kind of fire. So, um, you know, there's, but there's also, I've been on situations where a police officer was trapped in a car and the fireman showed up with the jaws of life. So, believe me, it's, it's a great deal of mutual respect. In that um, I became interested in apologetics. Now, how many of you were in the sermon this morning? Okay, so you, some of you heard Tom's definition of apologetic. Apologetic simply means defense of the faith. It is not, I am apologizing for. We get the term apologetics from the Greek word apologia. And that comes from 1 Peter 3.15, where, uh, everybody brought your Bibles? <laughs> oh, you got a real one. Wow. <coughs> um, okay, this is out of the NIV, but it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That word to give a defense in Hebrew is actually, or actually in Greek, is apologia. And that's where we get that word, is out of this verse. Okay? So that's what it means to give a defense. But notice that it's not to be offensive. Peter says to give a defense out of love and respect. So we're going to be talking about how do we give a defense without becoming offensive. And we're going to be working on that throughout this series. Um, we're going to give you some tactics, which by the way, I'm going to also be mentioning some fantastic books that I've read over the last couple of years that I highly recommend to you. Um, tactics by William Lane Craig is one of them. Tactics is actually how to answer some of the more difficult questions that atheists frequently ask. And not necessarily atheists, but many times just unbelievers. Uh, they may be agnostic, they may come from a different faith. 
but they ask these questions and quite often the common answer is, well, that's what the Bible says. What we're going to be doing is looking at how do we defend God, how do we defend miracles, how do we fit, defend the Bible, and how do we defend Christ without using the Bible. Because if we're going to be arguing with, and I use the term arguing in a respectful way, okay? If we're going to be arguing with non-believers, you can't just pull the Bible out and say, that's what this says. One of the things that really bugs me is the bumper sticker, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. That bugs the daylights out of me. Because what does that do to a non-believer? It's yeah. more about defensive. Exactly. Exactly. And we are to be lights on a hill. Okay? So, um, if you have that bumper sticker, please put it off. Okay? <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, Frank Turek, the author of the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, which, don't you love that title? Mm -hmm. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And you will see, it requires a lot more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. A whole lot more faith. But he has a, uh, his... Um, organization is called Cross Examined, and it's crossexamined.org. They have a bumper, bumper sticker. Have you, have you seen the one? Um, I can't remember exactly what it says because I've got his in mind. But it it, uh, it has all the symbols, different symbols of faith on there. And um, what does it say? It says um, coexist. Coexist. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Coexist. It has all the different symbols of faith on there. And he has one that says contradict with all the symbols of faith on there. Um, and, and, quite, and we're going to see today that the reality of it is that all of these different faiths contradict. They cannot all be true. So the, if you want to follow along with this series, I highly recommend getting this book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, by... Um, Frank Turek and Norm Geisler. Um, also, I'm going to be teaching a roadmap class on this. You're going to be getting the abbreviated version. What I'm going to be teaching in the roadmap class is the slightly less abbreviated version. And if you want the full version, get the book. Okay? The book is this thick. It's great material. Much of it is based on Josh McDowell's material, but there's a lot of other material that they've looked at. Um, and that has arisen over the years that they include in the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Okay? So let's get started. One of the first things we have to ask is, what is the purpose of your life? Has anybody in here ever asked that question, why am I here? Almost all humans come to that question at some point in time, right? So if you answer from an atheist perspective, you have to wonder, is life just a game of chance? I mean, it, it, are we supposed to just get on this earth and accumulate as much as we can accumulate, and at the end of it, we put it all back in the box and tuck it away? And someday, hopefully, somebody will come to your tombstone and look on there and go, oh, look when they were born and died. Is that it? Is that all there is? That's what people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Stephen Hawking would like for you to believe. <laughs> Bill Nye, the science guy, has a YouTube video out in which he's given a presentation in front of several hundred people, and he has a picture of Earth, and then he expands it to the solar system, and expands to the universe, and, and he ends up saying, I am just a speck among specklessness. Now, what a motivational speaker, huh? Yeah. Would you walk out of there feeling like, I've got to go charge and hit it. I am a speck among specklessness. Woo! -hoo! <laughs> That's how atheists truly, if you follow their logic, that is what they believe. Evolution, we just happened out of blind chance. Okay. This. You said the mighty word right there. What's that? Blind. Blind. <laughs> this is what? 
and share it, okay? Um, how many of you would happen to believe that after millions and millions of years, this thing actually just miraculously appeared? Right here. Anybody in here? And yet, the atheists want us to believe that something as complex as a human brain just miraculously appeared over a few million years, okay? We're going to be talking a little bit more about that as we go along. But this is the primary purpose of this question and of this study, is to determine whether or not we have purpose. Now, there's four questions that we're going to be looking at. In the book, there's actually 12, but we believe that if you can answer these four, you can answer beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, not beyond all doubt, because we're not given that opportunity. But beyond a reasonable doubt, you can answer whether or not Jesus is who he claimed to be. And these questions are, does truth exist, does God exist, are miracles possible, and is the New Testament true? Now, what about the Old Testament? Well, if the New Testament is true, who's in the New Testament that validates the Old Testament? Jesus. Jesus, right. Okay? So, if the New Testament is true, if truth exists, God exists, miracles are possible, the New Testament is true, we get the Old Testament thrown in. Okay? So, what, that's what we're going to be looking at. There are several books and CDs available at crossexamine.org that I highly recommend. I also recommend Lee Strobel's books, Case for Faith, Case for Christ. Another excellent one is uh, J. Warner Wallace. Um, Jim Wallace is a retired police officer out of Los Angeles. He was a cold case homicide investigator. He looked in his first book, Cold Case Christianity, he looked at the life of Jesus from a cold case homicide perspective. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about that as we go along. That's a great book, and it's really interesting because in each chapter, the beginning of each chapter, he actually talks about a cold case homicide that he worked and the type of investigation that he had to do, and then he uses that logic and that reasoning as he discusses that chapter. Yes, sir? Repeat his name, please. J. Period, Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R, -E Wallace. J. Warner Wallace. And I'll be talking more about him as we go along. In the roadmap course that I'll be teaching, I'll actually be doing part of one of his presentations, which is really pretty darn interesting. So these are the questions that we're going to be looking for. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A when we get towards the end of the series, okay? So, the first one we're going to look at is does truth exist? Now, this is a kind of an infamous movie that some of you all might remember. You guys remember this guy? Yes. Yep. All right, Tom Cruise's character is standing before, what's his name, Al Capone? <laughs> Jack. Jack Nicholson, thank yeah. you. Looks a little bit like Al Capone, though, doesn't it? <laughs> but Tom Cruise is standing before Jack Nicholson, and he's trying to get the truth in testimony. And what does Jack Nicholson, Nicholson respond with? You can't, you can't handle the truth. Right. Remember? Sometimes people just simply cannot handle truth. And we're going to be discussing that, too. My brother and I actually got into this conversation the other day. My brother is agnostic. And he and I had an interesting discussion, and he said, there is no such thing as truth. And I just looked at him, and I said, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you have to look at it from this perspective. Look at Santa Claus. And I said, yeah, let's do look at Santa Claus. And he said, well, as a child, you always grow up with Santa Claus is true, so therefore it's true. And I said, well, based on that logic, there's some people that still believe the world is flat. Does that make it true? There are. So, there are. Yes, sir. So, you see, what we're going to be learning how to respond with those kinds of objections is with questions. Make them think. You know? Make them validate their claim. So, truth is simply telling it like it is. Truth is that today, I can pretty well guarantee you, when we walk out of church, almost everyone in this congregation will be hot. All right? Absolutely. <laughs> that, that's an absolute truth, right? That's true. But there may be someone standing down near South Africa that today will walk out of their church, or yesterday, I guess by now, 
um, would walk out of their church service and be cold because it's winter time in South Africa, right? right. Or South Australia. Or South Australia, exactly. So does that mean truth is relative? No, truth refers to its reference. Remember back in the old English days when you were in high school, remember that your subject and your verb had to agree with one another or you had confusion, right? Truth is the same thing. We just have to make sure that we're applying truth to its reference, okay? Now, without getting too terribly complicated, when you do buy um, Frank Turk's book, this particular chapter can kind of, if you if you're not into philosophical thinking, this can get a little deep. All right. So if you just will get these basic principles, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the basic principles, then you can kind of understand the basic principles, learn some of the basic concepts, and then skip over the really fascinating part of the science, the cosmological and physiological arguments. Okay. So that really, it really gets to that bad. So. How do we learn to direct or redirect the question about truth? The first thing that we have to understand is that there is such a thing as the law of non-contradiction. Now, this is a philosophical law. It's a law just like gravity. If I were to take this, I'm going to take something that I can drop. <laughs> if I were to take this and let go, what would happen? Now, if I believe it's going to hover, is that going to make it hover? No. It's going to fall anyway, right? You don't know any better. Right. So, if you believe something, just because you believe it doesn't make it true. Okay? Now, this can apply to the Bible as well as to Hinduism, which is why we're going to be following this reasoning down the line. Because at one point or another, we have to determine truth. So somebody may say Islam is true, and somebody else may say Christianity is true. They cannot both be true, because they make contradictory claims. So we have to figure that out. All right? Opposite ideas cannot both be true at the same time and in the same sense, just like we were talking about with the flat earth. So. Over here is Oxford Professor John Lennox, and over here on the right is Oxford Professor Richard Dawkins. Lennox says God exists. Dawkins says God does not exist. Can they both be right? No. Only one can be right through the law of non-contradiction. Okay? Now, I happen to believe that the one that's right is Lennox. So, you know, we bald guys got to stick together, right? <laughs> But, yes, <laughs> that's right. Okay. The law of non-contradiction is undeniable. Even those who use it or deny it are using it. You cannot argue against the law of non-contradiction without contradicting the law of non-contradiction. Do you understand that? No. You do not. Okay. The law of non-contradiction just simply says two opposing ideas cannot both be true. Only one of those can be true. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that either are true, but let's assume that there's the earth is flat, the earth is round. One of those cannot be true. All right, that's what the law of non-contradiction means. Okay? So, if you were to contradict it. If you were to try and stand up and say, you're not right, they can both be true. What are you doing? You're contradicting the person making the statement. So you're using the law of non-contradiction to argue against it. <laughs> okay? So, and, and by the way, did you notice that picture? If you're still confused, it's okay. <laughs> I had to read this chapter. I've read this book now about four or five times. All right? This is not something that you're going to get just in a quick, simple setting. It takes time to truly understand this stuff and to process it. And you just kind of have to keep filling your head with it over and over and over again, which I like to do. <laughs> um, I'm weird that way. Now, Avicenna is a medieval philosopher. He was Muslim. And he once said, anyone who denies a law of non-contradiction should be beaten and burned until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as to be burned, 
and to be burned is not the same as to be beaten. Now, um, let me preface this. We do not believe that this is a good Christian tactic to take, okay? But the point is, beaten is not the same as to be burned, right? There are differences, and you can differentiate the, differentiate the differences, okay? So that's what this Muslim philosopher said was a good explanation of the law of non-contradiction. So, truth is absolute. What that means is truth is true for all, pe all people in all places at all times. It is true that we are going to be hot the moment we walk out the door on August the 9th at noon. That's true for all people at all places at all times. Now, if Joseph down in South Africa or South Australia walks out of his church and he's cool on August 9th, then that's true for all people at all places at all times too. Truth, it corresponds to its reverence, just like the verb has to correspond to its noun. Okay? So, when we look at objections to absolute truth, one of the things we have to understand is the argument of it. Now, when I was working on my PhD, I was sitting in a um, upper level course on philosophy and education. The lady teaching this upper level course was from China. She is Hindu. And she had written a book on her own life. And she spent quite a bit of time, she spent the whole first hour of the very first class in our philosophy class talking about how truth is relevant and relative. Okay? But truth is important to understand, but as it applies to the individual. So she talked a lot about how my truth is my truth and your truth is your truth, and if we understand that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, we can all learn to love one another so much more. We'll just live one big happy life because your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And she went on and on and on and on. And at the end of the class, I couldn't stand it any longer, in our group, we had the occupational education group. The occupational education is a bunch of people that already have occupations. And we're learning how to teach trainers in occupations. So we had a police major, I mean a, a US Army major. He was a medic that had already served two tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. We had a police chief from, the Bro from Broken Arrow, Todd Westwald. I was in that group. We had people that were in Votech. All of us were adults, okay? The other half of the class was from the elementary and secondary education group, all right? Um, now, I love teachers. Don't get me wrong here. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But there's a huge difference when you're dealing with children all the time as opposed to dealing with adults that want to kill you, okay? You tend to learn to think a little bit more critically. And so I'm looking over here at these secondary education and elementary education teachers, and I'm literally watching them in awe of this professor's lecture. They're just spellbound by everything that she's having to say, because she's so brilliant and very convincing. And I couldn't stand it anymore. The group kind of knew me by then. This was like, you know, the second year of the program, and I wasn't exactly one that always just accepted everything that was spilled upon us. So, but in the occupational education group, that was okay because that was part of the program. We, we learned how to debate with one another and how to discuss and, and do so amicably. So she finished her entire lecture on what the entire semester was going to be about, relative truth, and I just raised my hand and I said, man, I just got one simple question for you. If truth is true for you, but not for me, and that's true for her, but not for him, is that true for everyone? Because if it is, wouldn't that make it an absolute truth? <laughs> and that's kind of what happened to the elementary and secondary education teachers. They went, hey, wait a minute. If what's true for you is true for you but not for me, is that true for everybody? Because if it's true for everybody, it's an absolute truth. It's not a relative truth. And that was before I read any of his stuff. But it just didn't make any sense.
So that's how we're going to be looking at this stuff. Some people say there is no truth. You can't know the truth. All truth is relative. It's true for you, but not for me. So how do we answer that? Well, if no one has the truth, we can't. But, oh yeah, that's the other one. You ought not judge. Okay. But you can agree to disagree. Not yet. No? Okay. Not yet. Mystery. Okay, you ought not judge. Anybody ever heard that one in here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're going to learn how to respond to that one. Okay. So your greatest tool in answering these objections is simply called applying the claim to itself, which is what I did in that lecture, right? I just applied the claim to itself. So here's an example. If someone were to say, I can't speak a word in English, how would you respond to it? Didn't you just say that in English? <laughs> right, exactly. Okay? Now, we call this the roadrunner tactic. Why do we call it the roadrunner tactic? Because roadrunner was this scrawny little bird that Wiley e. Coyote thought he would chase all over the place, all the time, right? Now, if I were Wiley e. Coyote, I'd be looking for the big fat turkey. But he thought this roadrunner looked really scrumptious. So for whatever reason, he spent all his time chasing roadrunner. But roadrunner always outthought him would run up to the cliff, stick his foot out, and Wiley e. Coyote would go over the cliff and realize he had nothing to stand on. And that's what we're doing here with the Roadrunner tactic, is we're demonstrating to our opponent they've got no ground to stand on. Okay? So, because the person making the claim, all truth is relative, really cannot justify that logically. It's not possible. So here's how we're going to do this, okay? Here's the claim. There is no such thing as truth. Is that true? See how simple this is? Okay, now we're going to let you practice. <coughs> Here we go. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Is that true? Is that absolutely true? Is that, right? is that true for everybody? Are you sure about that? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Here's the next one. It's true for you, but not for me. Is that true for everybody? There you go. Okay. We're just going to apply the same response to their question or their statement. There's no truth in anything but science. Now, I'm sure that some of you guys have probably heard that one. How can we respond to this one? Okay. What's another way? How about prove it? But only using the scientific method. Use the scientific method to prove that there's no truth but science. Not possible. It's a philosophical argument not a scientific argument. Now, good science should be based on good reasoning. Would you agree with that? Many times, science is based on what we want the outcome to be. All right? So what are the Pardon? There's a lot of examples. For example, how many years did everyone on Earth believe that the world was flat? Because that's what the scientists of the day taught. Up until a non-scientist, a sailor, came and convinced the queen to give him a whole bunch of money, named Christopher Columbus. How many years did scientists not only claim that the Earth was the center of the universe, but would kill you if you disagreed? A man by the name of Magellan came along and said, uh, I don't think so. And what did they do to him? They made him recant. Okay? So, you have to be able to reasonably prove without presuppositions. And we're going to be using that tactic as we discuss this topic with non-Christians. Now, Immanuel Kant, how many of you guys have ever heard of Immanuel Kant? Okay, Immanuel Kant has had more to do with your philosophical beliefs than you would ever know, and you may never have heard of it. This guy lived in the 1800s, early 1800s, and he wrote several philosophical books 
talking about, you can't know the real world. But if you can't know the real world, then what is Immanuel Kant saying? He knows the real world, and you can't know it. But how does Kant know it? He has to be making a claim outside of the claim itself, doesn't he? If he's saying you can't know the real world. So, how about this one? You should doubt everything. How would you respond to that? Okay, why should you doubt everything? Or, should I doubt that? <laughs> there you go. Okay? How many of you have doubted your doubts? How many of you have doubted your doubts? Okay? Yeah, Frank Turek makes the explanation in his video. Every morning, before my first cup of coffee, I wake up, I'm an atheist. After coffee kicks in, I start being able to reason again. <laughs> you know, there are days when we just have struggled believing, right? But because we have struggles believing, does that mean that the truth of God changes? What changes? Us, right? It's our emotion. It's not reason. It's not the truth. It's our emotion. Okay? So, how about this one? This is one of my favorites. You ought not judge. How do we respond to that? Judge not unless you be judged. Okay, that's only half the verse. Oh. How do we respond to this one? Are you judging me? Oh, yeah. Aren't you judging me for judging me? Because you're judging me, I'm judging you. Yeah. Exactly. See, now Jesus, we're not going to really get into a whole lot of biblical lessons in this, but just understand when you read that, you ought not judge lest ye be judged, you better go on and read the rest of the verse. Okay? Because what Jesus was talking about when he was saying, don't go pulling the log, or go, go pulling the splinter out of your brother's eye until you pull the log out of your own, what is he actually saying there? Is he saying don't judge? No. Judge. He's saying judge yourself first. Yeah. Okay? Are you right here before you go help your brother or correct your brother? Okay? That's what he's saying. He's not telling us not to judge. As a matter of fact, we see great examples of Jesus judging. Remember the temple where he tossed over the tables? Okay? We see very good examples of that. But we need to be careful to do it out of respect and love, just like 1 Peter 3.15 admonishes us to do. So the truth about truth. Here's the point. Contrary beliefs are possible, but contrary truths are not. You can believe in Santa Claus, you cannot believe in Santa Claus. That changes not whether Santa Claus actually exists. Right? That's right. Contrary beliefs are possible, contrary truths are not. So you can believe that everything is true, but everything cannot be true. You can go to the Unitarian Church and believe that all religions will get you to heaven as long as you're sincere about it, but that doesn't change the truth, does it? Okay? So that's where we're going to. Is we have to be able to look at objective truth which cannot be denied without first being affirmed. Objective truth cannot be denied without being affirmed. Because what it means is, if you're going to make the claim that objective truth is false, you simply turn that on its face and say, is that true? Because that's all we did there. We just turned the claim on itself. Okay. It's very simple. So what we're going to be doing next week is we're going to be looking at, does God exist? Okay. Now, I only went into one portion. I only went into one tactic of does truth exist. I looked at the Roadrunner tactic. Now, there are several other tactics out there. And like I said, William Lane Craig and Greg Kopel have great uh, methods. Uh, so does Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell. Josh and his son, Sean McDowell, are now writing several books. They have an excellent book 
on how to answer some of the most difficult questions in the Bible. Uh, people may come to you at some point and ask you, well, what about this genocide that God commanded back in the Old Testament? Well, what we don't know is how many times were those people given an opportunity to repent? And yet, what we do know, because paleontology and archaeology have discovered that most of those cultures, as a matter of fact, all of the cultures that the Old Testament Hebrews wiped out when they were first taken to the land of Israel, all of them worshipped various idols and gods that required child worship, or child mutilation and sacrifice. All of them did that. And they also required, many of them, orgies as a sexual or as a um, um, worship act. Okay? So even women that were married were required to go serve in the temple as prostitutes. And all of, you know, just the stuff that went on at that time is beyond our imagination. For most of us, okay? Now, unfortunately, I worked sex crimes. So, unfortunately, I spent four years in sex crimes. And pretty much everything that happened way back then is still happening today. If you don't know about it, you don't need to know about it. Okay? Just be aware that you don't want to let your children and grandchildren walking around at 2 o'clock in the morning. You do not want to send them to France to model. Okay? Not a good idea. Because 14, 15 years old, they will become sex slaves. And that's just in the regular model of the industry. I'm reading a really good book right now. Um, how many of you all remember Kevin Sorbo? Hercules? Mm -hmm. him? I'm reading his autobiography right now. And he talks about modeling. Um, he started off his career in his 20s as a model. And he went to France to uh, for a modeling job. And he was hired by a very well-known and I, I won't mention the name, but ladies, you would know this guy. Um, he designed dresses and, you know, very, very well-known person. And the man asked Kevin Sorbo over to two or three different dinners, was introducing him to all of these people like Madonna and Elton John and all of these very famous people. And then one time he invited him over to his house. Kevin thought he was going over to a party. Turns out it was just he and this guy, and the guy came on to it pretty strong. Hmm. And he and Kevin says in there, if you have a 14-year-old daughter and she gets a modeling contract to go to France, don't send her. Because what ends up happening is, is they become toys to the rich and influential in the world. Hmm. Now, you don't want to believe that's happening, but guess what the truth is? Okay. So just because you don't want to believe that kind of stuff exists, does that change the fact that it's, that it's happening? Oh. I just completed another book that I highly recommend to you, especially if you have any Muslim friends. This book is called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by Nabil Qureshi. N-A-B-E-E-L Qureshi, Q-U-R, there's no E in there, Q-U-R-E-S-H-I. In this, he talks about the story growing up in a Muslim home with Muslim parents, but growing up within the United States. His father was in the U.S. Navy, and they always taught him that Islam was a faith of peace, that it was a faith of hope, and so that's, that's what he believed growing up. When he went to college, he roomed with a, a guy by the name of David. And David was a young college guy, but he happened to understand apologetics pretty well. And so Nabil liked picking on Christians because he could ask some of these hard questions to Christians and you, their response would always be, uh, because unfortunately what our youth group has become, not as great, but just kind of in general what we teach in our youth is, Jesus loves you no matter what, let's go sing happy songs. And we're not teaching them reason and logic and debate. 
okay? We're not teaching them theology on countering and preparing for these situations, just like Tom was talking about. And he's not joking when he says there are college professors who literally want to dissuade your children from their beliefs. He's not joking about that. That is very serious. I happen to know some of those college professors. What Nabil discovered over about a five-year journey was first he had to learn that there were ways to intelligently examine Christianity and the Bible. And then once he learned the tactics and methods of intelligently examining Christianity, he began to intelligently examine his own faith. Now, in the, in the Muslim mind, it's different than our mindset. We tend to reason logically. They tend to place all authority upon mother and father and their elders. It's okay to debate the Quran. That's not a big deal for them because they can't truly understand the Quran. They get their true understanding from their elders. The elders is what holds wisdom. When he learned not only to examine the Quran, that's when he decided to see what the elders said. When he sought out the elders, he examined that they contradicted one another and frequently even contradicted themselves. And he's trying to figure all this stuff out. And then all of a sudden he comes to that mental cognitive realization that Islam cannot be true. And that Jesus is who he said he is. And so he knew it here, but he hadn't yet claimed it here. And that's another thing that we're going to see. There is a big difference between knowing and accepting. And we're going to be looking at that as we go down the next several weeks, too. Okay? So we have time for about five minutes of questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, you'll probably talk on this subject in the future, but you know, doesn't the primary thing that we need to know is how the Bible became the Bible? I mean, um, and who wrote it? Is it true? We're going to be looking at that in our third set, okay? So about weeks three and four, we're going to start looking at, is the Bible what it, it claims to be? It claims to be the Word of God, okay? But keep in mind, Richard Dawkins, who wrote the book, The God Delusion, says the book is full of contradictions and is not true, all right? Linux and several others say that the Bible is the Word of God. They cannot both be true, right? One of them has to be wrong if there's such thing as absolute truth. And that's what we were looking at today. We have to first establish does truth exist. And I think, hopefully, just using one argument, only using the Roadrunner tactic, I'm hoping that we've been able to determine that truth does exist. And we can demonstrate that simply by saying, when somebody says to you that truth doesn't exist, ask them if that's just the truth. Is that true? Yes. Well, isn't that based on belief? If you believe, then for you it exists. And talking about philosophy of religion, in the beginning, human needs that believe this huge energy that they could see around them. So they started thinking, and some genius started writing and creating, and of course, that was all Christian, which I have to mention that it's not copy of Jewish religion. Absolutely. All the tradition, all the laws, all the beliefs. Okay, if you, if you actually go back and read the Quran, read Nabil's book. Read the Bill's book, because he actually breaks that down step by step. Um, Islam is not a direct copy, because what they do is there's many things, for example, if you go and read the Old Testament as a Muslim, much of that agrees with what you've been taught as a child. Okay? But if you actually go and read what Muhammad wrote in the Quran, there are multiple contradictions to the Old Testament. Multiple contradictions. Okay? 
Nabil was never taught as a child that the Quran in Surah 26 actually says to kill the unbeliever. He was never taught that as a child because of his type of Muslim faith, that was not part of it. But that's, that's one of the things Muhammad said. There were two different times that Muhammad wrote, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but Muhammad wrote at one point when he was in a city where he was outnumbered, and he didn't want to make certain claims because he didn't want to be annihilated. He wrote several years later, which by the way, that's another thing about the Quran. The Quran does not necessarily progress in a chronological order, okay? There are sections of the Quran where you're reading one section and then it skips several years and it just doesn't seem to make any sense. Well, it's the order that talks about like the length of the, right. the, the thing, so it's not an order. Right, and, and it just it, it gets very confusing. Everything gets abrogated in the end and it's all white, but this is more white because it's later and all this other nonsense. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not kidding, that's what we're it, it is very confusing. But, but that's why they rely so heavily on the authority. So you tell us about the early years and the doing the later years. That's what happens. Right. So in, in, in his later years, he outnumbered many of these cities. Mm -hmm. So that's when he started saying, you ought to kill the unbeliever. You have to kill the unbeliever. They either convert or they get killed. Okay. So, yes? You just mentioned that Joshua did the same thing when they went to the promised land. You said they killed those people because they were uh, idol worshippers, their religion was to sacrifice the children. It's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. They well, were given, I mean, yeah, you believe it's not, okay. but I believe it is. Okay. <laughs> if, if you will go in this and... This one is true. If, if, I'm going to have to challenge you to read that book first. Okay? Read Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus first. That's his belief. Just if you follow the logic, you just have to follow the reasoning, and then you have to look at it from an objective perspective. Because one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to look at this from a criminalist point of view. If and I'm, I'm going to give a better demonstration of this a little bit later. But if I walk into a homicide and I've got lying over here on a bed a dead woman, and over here next to the bed I got a picture that's turned face down. And I pick the picture up and I look at the picture and there's a man embracing the woman. Now as a homicide investigator, if I look at that picture and say, find this man, we've got our suspect. That's called a presupposition. And it can send you in the wrong direction. On purpose. On purpose. In much the same way, if you walk into a religious debate or argument with a presupposition, you can go chasing after the wrong direction, okay? So what we're learning by looking through this in an apologetic standpoint is can contradictory truths exist? Can the earth be both flat and round at the same time just depending on what you believe? No. Cannot be. Islam claims to be the one and only true way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Islam says that Christianity is polytheism. There's no such thing as a trinity for preaching polytheism. Christianity says that God can exist in three persons. Not three gods, one God, three persons. Okay? They cannot both be true. Only one. If, if, and we haven't gotten there yet, if theism is true. Because, and we still have left out the entire argument of Judaism. Okay? But before we narrow it down to Judaism, Hindu, or uh, Islam, and Christianity, which is one God, theism, we have to eliminate polytheism and atheism. Polytheism is multi gods. Atheism is no God. Pantheism is everything's God. Use the force, Luke. <laughs> okay. As a matter of fact, Star Wars is all about pantheism. That, that's literally what it's about. Okay. So, yeah, one more question. We've got right now. Yes. Well, also we talk about 
that's religion that those bad people had, that they had to be killed and wiped off mm -hmm. and all this. Didn't Abraham claim that God told him, go and sacrifice your only child? Mm -hmm. And he took him up there to do it. So here comes, that's a tradition, that's whatever you call it. Probably those people, God told them to send you. So how should we know? Right. And there, there's a, there's a, that's an hour long sermon, okay? Um, Tom actually just taught a, a 30 minute sermon based on it. But a lot of that, where a lot of that tradition comes from is remember that Abraham, when he first came to faith in God, he wasn't necessarily a theist. He lived in a polytheistic society. And what did he say? I worship the um, God of gods, right? And in scripture, we read over and over again, he worships the greatest. It wasn't until later that Abraham came to this conclusion that there was only one God. All right? One of those traditions in that day and age was child sacrifice, which, by the way, we still do that today. Um, we sacrifice our children to, and I, I risk offending people when I say this, but I believe it's totally true. We sacrifice our children to the idols of choice and convenience. But, we must define something. Yes, exactly. But, what he was doing then, God was demonstrating two things. God was first demonstrating love through sacrifice. That was actually Abraham and Isaac actually a precursor to Christ, pointed to Christ, that God would provide the land. And God did provide the land through Christ. But he also provided the land for Isaac, didn't he? But it was also a, it was a test for Abraham, but in many ways it was a test that Abraham would be expected to do because the first male child of that time and that culture was expected to be sacrificed the gods. That was just part of it. Okay. So, anyway, there's there's a whole lot more into that, and we need to be wrapping up. We've got people looking in your window already. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, we talked about atheism, and it, to me, is very, very sad. This guy, young, he was talking about the other in the office, and he said he takes his son to a day camp, and unfortunately, it's religious. And I just and he, um, and he has to be with his son every day. I just pray that that child is not supposed to be free. And then yeah. he is associated with people that are religious. One, one question to ask people at the beginning of a discussion, whenever you're getting into a discussion, and, and we could probably sit and have a, a nice long discussion um, about differences in, in philosophy and religion and so forth. But the first question you need to ask someone is if I can demonstrate to you that Christianity were true. Well, actually, let me back that up. The very first question you need to ask someone is can I ask you a spiritual question? That's the very first question. Can I ask you a spiritual question? If they say no, what do you think about the football game last night? Literally, move on. Don't don't yeah. go there. Don't argue with them. Respect and love, right? If they say yes, if I could demonstrate to you that Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? If they say no, wait a minute. I thought you were a beacon of reason and truth. Okay. If I did, I asked you, and this I asked, I did this with my dad. I literally did this with my dad. If I could demonstrate to you that Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And he said, I don't think you could do that. And I said, that wasn't my question. My question was, if I could demonstrate to you that Christianity were true, beyond a reasonable doubt, not all doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, would you become a Christian? And he said, I don't think you could do that. <laughs> and I looked at my dad and I said, what would you think of the football game last night? <laughs> And he said, why are you changing the topic? And I said, because you're not willing to reason. So there's no sense in going down that road. 
and just left it. You know, it's kind of like I literally sat in the patrol car trying to share the gospel with a the drunk. There's no reason. <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't even go there. I mean, this, you know. So, thank you guys so much. I've enjoyed it.